Welcome to This Old Camera. I'm your host, Azrael Knight, and in this episode, I'm going to tell you all about the advanced photo system. I met this girl in Venice. It was a day I wanted to remember forever. It was a day I... I didn't load the film right. Kodak Advantix cameras have easy drop-in film loading. The Advanced Photo System was released in April of 1996 and was a joint venture between Kodak, Canon, Fuji, Nikon, and Minolta. The format was developed under the secret project name Orion and took over five years of research to produce. APS was designed to be a complete system from start to finish, from the film to the camera to the lab, all the way to personal archiving, it was meant to be one smooth workflow. The cartridge is called an IX240. IX standing for information exchange. 240 for the film's physical size. The cartridge has a status indicator on the bottom, letting you know if the film is used or not. A circle was unexposed. A half circle was partially exposed. A cross was fully exposed. And a rectangle was processed. You heard that right you get your developed film back in the cartridge. But not just that, you got a print with all of your photos and thumbnail version, and of course, your prints. If you were shooting a lot of APS, you'd probably have one of these catalog cases. Your cartridge snaps into place and the index card goes into a sleeve on the left. The film itself is quite fascinating too. The base is composed of polythalene naphthalate, which is more resistant to breaks. And my guess is, is it's because the film is gonna be wound and rewound back into the cartridge more than a 35 millimeter roll. A magnetic coating is placed evenly along the entire back surface of the film and is responsible for data on the film cartridge. In the advanced cameras, it can tell you if the shot was vertical, if enough flash was used, if the background is too dark, even your aperture and shutter speed. Or if you want, you can add a caption. You can wind the film, take it out, and reload it later, and it will read which frames have been shot and advance to a fresh one. The film also came with fail safes like double exposure prevention, foolproof loading, and the inability to open the camera while the film is unwound. Not only that, but there was a six digit ID system found on the canister and encoded on the magnetic strip of the film to help both the photo processor and customer recall the right film. The cheaper cameras would use optical heads instead of magnetic to record the information onto the film, but all of the cameras would have this main feature and selling point. A film so advanced it loads in a second, and a camera that gives you the choice of three picture sizes. The main feature they pushed to consumers besides the overall ease of use was the ability to take three different picture sizes. This wasn't a true crop, though it would appear that way in some viewfinders. What actually happened is your preferences are recorded to the film and the lab completes the process by printing the images in the appropriate ratios. In 1996, popular photography featured a massive advertising of APS in the March issue. It not only came with a booklet explaining APS, but in addition to the seven and a half page review was an eight page ad. They said, APS seems to be heading into a class all its own one that 126, 110, and disc film failed at. That's a bold statement. In their in-depth review, they said that APS could do an 11 by 17 print at normal viewing distance and that this was acceptable, though they admitted that getting within arm's reach, you could see the lower quality. The system was endorsed by celebrities such as Rosie O'Donnell. The Hot Pockets guy. Up right after that. Hey, can I tell you about the Kodak Advantage? Take a look through there. Yeah. It's drop and loading. People get such a kick out of this. It's like magic. It's got three picture sizes. And even the Marble Rye Lady. And finally she did it. And how was Paris? The picture of a lifetime. You cut your head off. You should have had a Kodak Advantix camera with three picture sizes for better pictures. You were told you were an idiot for not having one of these, whether you were American. How about an index print so it's easy to order reprints? Didn't think so. Or British. Can your camera take different picture sizes whenever you want? Oh, shame. Here's a technological oddity. 
The Kodak Advantix camera has a preview screen. Introducing the Kodak Advantix oh. preview camera. Just push the button right there. Where is my head? It's the only film camera that lets you see a picture right after you take it. I find that interesting because it has all the marks of a digital camera, a compact size, an LCD, the ability to see your photos, but it's still film. It goes everywhere. Also promoted was the ever-popular one-time-use cameras. Kind of like you. This wasn't like disc film where all you had were automatic point shoots. You could buy an APS SLR, like the Canon iX, the Minolta Vectus S series, and the Nikon Pronia. Let's talk about accessories for a moment. Companies like Fujifilm and Minolta also released a device like this that turned your developed film into a slideshow viewer on your TV. It had options for transitions and even a couple music choices. And if you had something called a Snappy, you could turn it into a full-blown scanner. I did a full review on the Fujifilm AP-1 and I'll leave a link at the end cards. One thing I think they got right are these archive cases. I think it's a real clever way to keep everything stored. APS wasn't without its flaws though. It was smaller, which meant a decrease in quality. That is a physical reality, even with today's digital sensors. Some of these setbacks are not a deal breaker for a lot of people, but here's where we run into a major flaw. If you were a photo finisher, you needed to go through a process to get your certified Advanced Photo System Photo Finishing Service logo, and it didn't come cheap. And if you were an independent film lab in the mid 1990s just getting by, this would impact your business. So the lab loses out on that revenue and the consumer has less places to take their film. Some photographers saw this as a marketing ploy, a way to force expensive equipment into photo finishing centers and drown out the mom and pop shops. KenRockwell.com, a site well known for camera reviews, wrote in 1999, just say no to APS. APS would trek along for another five years, presumably on a decline because on January 13th, 2004, Kodak announced in part of a press release that they'd be ceasing production of their reusable APS cameras. Eight years later, on May 22nd, 2012, Fuji announced it would no longer be manufacturing APS film. At the time of filming this review, that's only five years. That doesn't seem like that long ago. So why did APS fail? Well, one theory is that even though it was user-friendly for consumers, all of that extra work was being put on the photo finishers, not to mention expensive. I did find a more official answer in this book, Brand Failures by Matt Haig. In it, he says that between 1996 and 1998, Kodak invested 200 million into the system, only to discover they had distribution problems, that not enough retailers wanted to carry the film cameras, and there were not enough places to get the film processed. Hag says that in 1997, Advantix made up for 20% of all Kodak sales, but in the end, that wasn't enough. Some might call APS a failure, but it did technically survive the digital boom, even if only by a few years. Plus, you can still get it developed in some places, just like in the old days. I bought this Canon iX Lite for the purposes of this review, but I must say I'm very happy with the results. And I'll show you some photos I took, but first I want to give you a rundown of its operation basics. The Canon iX Lite operates like many modern Canon SLR and DSLRs with a few exceptions. The iX Lite takes two CR2 batteries and load face up on the bottom right side. Attaching a lens is the same as any other EF mount by lining up the red dots and turning clockwise. Removing a lens is done by pressing the lens release here and turning counterclockwise. This camera does not take EFS lenses. Powering on is accomplished by turning from L to any of the program or manual modes with the dial on the back left. To load a roll of APS film, lift this tab on the top left, twist in the direction of the arrow and the compartment springs free. Open the film door completely drop the APS film in and close. If done correctly, the film will advance to the first frame. Choose shooting mode with the mode dial. You have all your standard auto and manual choices seen by Canon in recent years. Choose a frame type with the switch to the right of the LCD. There are three modes, 
APS-P for panoramic, APS-H for high definition, and APS-C for classic. Your camera will always capture the whole frame, but will write the info to the cartridge and will then be read and printed by our photo lab. There are three focus points and you can select them individually or use all three by pressing the focus button on the top and then using the dial next to it. Exposure compensation is achieved by using the AV button located just below the lens release. This acts as a shift button. Hold it down and use the top right dial to adjust exposure compensation plus or minus two stops in AV and TV mode. Use it in manual to adjust aperture. To bracket your photos, press the function button located at the back until you see the arrow on the LCD reach the bracket symbol. Then use the dial to adjust up to two f-stops. Once all the photos have been taken, the camera will stop and wind back into the canister automatically. You can then open the top just as before. And here are the results of my field test. To test the Canon iX Lite, I went to Dorothy, Alberta and I shot a couple rolls. And while the black and white film didn't turn out spectacular, the sealed Fujifilm Nexia turned out fantastic considering it expired in April 2005. Being able to use my best lenses was also a nice touch. Let's talk about some pros and cons. Pros. If you're using an SLR, it will record very much like metadata, including date, shutter, and aperture settings. For the average person, it's easier to keep track of this film in your archive. No need to re-sleeve or write the date or even make a contact print. Cons. The problem with Kodak claiming that smaller formats like these have finer grain and improved sharpness is the same technology is eventually applied to the larger film formats. To really take advantage of everything APS has to offer, one really has to invest in the entire ecosystem. An SLR, going to the lab for proper processing, and have something like the AP-1 to be able to recall those metadata-like features like your shutter and aperture. If you're looking to give this a go, the price of an APS SLR is anywhere between $50 to $150 depending on its condition. If you want the freshest film possible, buy in bulk as they tend to get treated better when kept in larger quantities. Be on the lookout for any expired near 2012 and remember not to overpay. There is no reason why you should be paying any more than a regular roll of film. I feel like part of the reason my photos turned out so well was that it was double sealed, probably protected it. So keep an eye out for packaged rolls rather than loose ones. If you wanna scan your own negatives instead of ordering prints, I found a useful link here that basically tells you to just use a small flathead screwdriver to unwind the film out of the cartridge. Also, you might get a laugh with Kodak's FAQ on APS film, which is still up. It has questions like, why does APS have a plastic door instead of the fuzzy stuff? What kind of ink should I write with on the cassette? And can I thaw Advantix film in the microwave? I'll include those and other links in the description. What camera, system, or film should I review next? Let me know in the comments. That's all for now. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. You could also consider becoming my patron on Patreon. And until next time, stay classic.